All right, Psalm 73. Now, before we even get into this psalm, since we are in Psalm 73, I was just going to point out, um, you may or may not have known this about the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is divided into five books. Um, some Bibles will show that and some don't. So, for example, the one that I have up here right now, it says book number three, starting in Psalm 73. So some will have it, some won't. But um, the way that it's divided up, you got Psalms 1 through 41 is book number one. 42 to 72 is book number two, 73 to 89 is book number three, and then 90 to 106 is number four, and then 107 to 150 are, uh, is, is, Psalm, uh, is book number five. And I'm not going to spend much time going into all the details of, of why they chose a separation. And to be honest with you, I'm not that educated on, on all of the, you know, any of all the reasons for the separations. I think it has to do with um, definitely some of the, the works, like a lot of the next psalms that are coming up are psalms of Asaph. Like, like kind of grouped together. There's some groupings based on um, a few different factors. But just pointing out that they are split up and we're starting a new book, just so you could kind of be aware of that as we go forward. You might see a transition. Notice a lot of the themes have been very similar up to this point. I mean, I, I kind of feel like I've been repeating a lot of the same stuff over and over and over again. Um, and that does have a lot to do with being collected in these books uh, the way that they are. So um, just just pointing that out so you could maybe uh, keep that in your memory as we continue to go forward and be like, yeah, I could see the, the, the thread here, the similar vein uh, as we go through these. So, But let's jump down here. Verse number one. I love this whole psalm. The psalm is great. Um, I'm not going to do as much of the really digging into a specific verses because this psalm is very... Um, expressing kind of one main point. So we will dig a little bit here and there, but, but there's um, one main point here about the prosperity of the wicked and, and to, an, to an observer and here a Christian observer looking at that person just as a high level overview, looking at someone that's out in the world that's being very successful, right? In the world's eyes, they've got everything going for them. They've got the money, their health, their family or whatever, like everything just looks like they're doing great. But they're a wicked person. And this Christian's looking at this guy going like, what gives, man? You know, my life isn't like that. I'm struggling. I'm having all these problems. And this guy, you know, like these guys are just living life. They've got everything they could want and, and they're doing just fine. And they even seem to die a, a peaceful death and, and everything seems fine. They're living these lives and, and it just seems great. Like, what, like why wouldn't I want to do that, you know? And then he realizes and, and, and sees that that's a foolish thought and understands that, no, that's not the end for them, that you know, there's, there's, there's more to come. And that that's the best that they have it in this life. But so that's like this, this psalm from a real high level. It's a great psalm to, to look to, especially for people that, that do see injustices in this world, right? Because injustices happen. And what we need to remind ourselves is, is just continually understand, look, just like Jesus prayed that thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you pray and you ask for God's will to be done here because it normally isn't done, right? Like the standard isn't that just, well, God's will is just always being done on this earth, as the Calvinists might have you think. If it was always being done, then why did Jesus even ask that God's will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven? In heaven, absolutely everything is done according to the will of the Lord because he's sitting in heaven and he's ruling and reigning, and, and, but down here, there's a different God of this world, and it doesn't mean that God's not all-powerful and able to do whatever he wants, but the Bible teaches us that Satan is the God of this world, that right now he's running about and he's having all kinds of influence, and there's a lot of wicked people and a lot of people doing wicked things, and things are not the way that God had intended them to be, but he gave us a free will. He gave us the ability to choose to do good or evil, and some people choose to do evil, and that's the way that this world goes. But there is an end to this world. There is going to be a transformation. There's going, you know, Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to set everything right, and things do always and will always work out 
uh, the way that God said it will work out and that their justice will always be served. The wickedness does not go unpunished. Every wickedness that's ever been done on this earth receives its just recompense. For the believer, that just recompense was poured out on Jesus Christ. And for the unbeliever, they receive the full recompense of their sins in eternity in hell. So that's the way it works out. But let's dig into this, and, and this is really, really good language here, uh, really great truths in the scripture, of course. Uh, as you know, that's why you're here. Let's look at verse number one. The Bible reads, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. God is good, you know, saying to Israel, but the Israel of God isn't some physical nation, right? And it never really was. The, the Israel of God, yes, there was a physical nation, it was referred to Israel. Absolutely. I'm not saying that that didn't exist. And God gave his oracles unto that nation and unto his prophets from within that nation. And, and God was using that nation as a lighthouse in the Old Testament. Yes, 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 it's all true. But the, 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 the true people of God have always been, Old Testament, New Testament alike, those that put their faith in the Lord, always. That's always been the people of God. They've always been the children of promise, the people that believe in that promise, the people who believe in the Messiah to come. Those have, oh, that's always been the Israel of God. And the circumcision that was established with Abraham was an external uh, uh, thing that, you know, that, that, was, that was done, that was performed physically. But what God was most interested in was the circumcision of the heart. And, and it symbolized that. It was, it was an outward expression of the symbolic nature of, of your heart being circumcised and opened up to God. Just like the baptism is a physical thing that we do in the New Testament. But what is it? It's a, it's a representation. It's symbolic of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and that that's where your faith is. Right? So these things that happened in the past, it's not like circumcision ever saved anybody. But it was a sign. It was a seal of the covenant that God had made. Baptism doesn't save anybody. But it's an outward expression of the faith that you have in your heart, trusting in our Lord and Savior that was, that was uh, crucified, dead, buried, and rose again from the dead for you. So, uh, you know, those that are of a clean heart here, the Bible says God is good to Israel, to, such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He was like, I was close to slipping. I was about ready to fall. And he says, why? For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he's like, I was ready to fall. He was getting ready to, to have this big fall, spiritually speaking, because he looked at foolish people. He looked at wicked people that were in prosperity, and he says, I was envious at that. And we need to, to you know, take heed to this whole psalm and to the rest of the teaching we're getting from Scripture, never to fall for the trap of being enchanted by this world's riches and goods or the people that have those things. The wicked people in power, the wicked people. And, and, and I'll tell you what, it's easy to sit here and have people far removed from you that are living in these luxury, luxurious situations and things like that, right? And, and it's easy when you're really separated from it to not be sucked into that at all. But the real draw is going to come when you ever do have an opportunity to experience any of that luxury for yourself or you get invited in and it's like, oh man, this is a mat. You know, I didn't even know places like this existed or whatever. And people are, are really experiencing the, the, the luxury of this world. That's when it gets to be the, the, where the envy and the covetousness can come in. That's when it gets to be a problem where you start to think like, wow, I want to have this. He's living great. He's got everything in order. He's got everything he wants. He seems to have even time for his family, everything, you know, whatever, right? Like all the stuff that you want to have, it just seems like they have it. But don't be looking at the foolish or the wicked people of this world that do seem on the outward appearance to have all this stuff and be thinking that, uh, that's what you want, that the prosperity of the wicked is something to attain or strive for or be envious of. It's a trap. And we'll continue on looking at this. It says, for, and he's going to say more about this, there are no bands 
in their death, but their strength is firm. So up until the time they die, there's no, they're, not, they're not broken, they're not um, in, in, in jail, they're not, you know, like they have, they have no problems really. They still retain their strength to their death. He says they are not, trub- they are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. They seem to have no problems, right? The common man has, has problems. <laughs> we, all, we all got our fair share of problems to deal with. But you can look at some of these people and it's like, man, they got it. They don't have a care in the world. Everything seems to be working out for them just fine. And that's the allure and that's the attraction, but that's a deception. And then it says in verse 6, therefore... So because they have no problems like other men do, because they're not plagued like other men, therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. So these people that are full of riches and don't have any problems and, and you know, they're, not, they're not very humble. They're full of pride. Why? Because they don't have need of anything. They haven't been brought low. They're living in such a way that I've got it all. What do I need a God for? What do I need you for? What do I need anybody for? I've got it all myself. And they start getting a, a really high view of themselves. And this is where then a lot of the wickedness comes in to exploit other people because the higher view you have of yourself and the prouder you are and the more you think just so grand and high of yourself, it's, it's going to have to fit that you're thinking a lot less of everyone else. Where people literally will start to equate their righteousness and their goodness with how much wealth and power and everything else that they have compared to other people. And they look down and people that, that get achieve this high class status will start thinking of people as low class people as being beneath them and not having as much value even as a person as them. And they justify doing wicked things and, and keeping people down and in, in servitude. These days the servitude is, is more invisible than visible, but it's still there. And they, and they do this stuff because the pride gets their head. They think they're so much better. It says, violence covereth them as a garment. Violence. Now, <laughs> oh man. We, I don't really know if I want to open this up right now, but I'm so sick of the, of the culture today that, that tries to tell you that like your words and your speech is violence. Have you heard this? Yeah. We've been accused of this too. This is another one of the accusations that we're violent towards people of color here in this church because of what's preached, that we're, we're violent. I, say, I, don't, I respond to one of them, say, I don't think you know what violent means. And, and seriously, in and, and the more, oh man, I, I'm, the more people throw around words and try to apply them in, in areas that they don't fit, you're destroying the meaning of the word altogether. So when people are talking about, oh, your words are violent. Oh, they hurt me so bad. Then you read the Bible, and it talks about these wicked people, these rich people are full of pride, and their violence covered them as a garment. It's not talking about their language. It's not talking about their speech. It's not talking about the things that they say. They're violating other people. They have violence towards people, like real, actual violence. Sorry, snowflake. You know, words are not violence. You've never experienced violence if you think words are violence. I'm sorry, you haven't. When you actually experience violence, you'll know, hey, that's violent. And I hope you don't ever have to experience violence. I I do. Like, I mean that. But you really need to wake up if you think that someone saying something you don't like is violent. These people are violent. And that's who the real enemy is anyways. These are the enemies that are trying to pit us common folk against each other. It's these people in power that have all the wealth and riches that are designing and propagating these lies of racism to try to get people pitted against each other. Amen. Those are the ones you should be mad at. Amen. Verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. 
They have more than heart could wish. I mean, they're just rich. They have, they, they, like you think about how, what are all the things you could wish for? They have more than that. <laughs> I mean, they have, they have more than you could possibly want. They have it and then some. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. There's that pride again. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. They don't care about God. They don't care about any of it. They care about themselves. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? They, they think they could just get away with everything that they do. And this is the arrogance of the ruling elite class. It's the, the Clintons and the Epsteins and all, all of the ruling class. I mean, you just go on and on down the list. They think they're never going to get caught, right? Why? Because they're not afraid to kill people yep. if it looks like they are going to get caught. Yeah. Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's never gonna that that's never gonna die. <laughs> Epstein's dead, but that's never gonna die. That's that's an example of, of these wicked people that the Bible is referring to right here. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Now keep your place here in Psalm 73. Flip to the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter number 23. Let's go forward to the book of Proverbs, the next book, Proverbs 23. There is a lot of teaching on this subject. Of course, we, we've stopped at the point here where he's, he's looked at the, at the prosperity of the wicked. He's seen all that they have. And the Bible now is describing their wickedness before he's kind of catching himself and going, yeah, I was stupid. I shouldn't have even had that thought. But we're going to see more um, wisdom, again, as I said, from, from Scripture here in Proverbs 23. Look at look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler... Consider diligently what is before thee and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. So remember what I was just talking about, about it, it's one thing to just have nothing to do with the luxury. and so, It's not going to be a thought for you. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but for me, you know, day to day, I'm thinking about fixing holes in my house and, you know, all, all the issues and problems and doing all these other things. And it's like, man, I got this to fix and this to fix and this to fix. And, you know, it's like... So, like, thinking about just not having any of that stuff isn't even a thought because there's not time to even think about those stuff, right? There's, just, there's too many other things going on. But if you do have an opportunity, and, yeah, I'm trying to think if I've ever even really been in... I've just barely kind of been on the outside to see a little glimpse or a taste of this, but not even really that much. Just thinking in my life, trying to think of if that's ever really happened. Not really. But if you do have that opportunity, take heed to what the Bible's saying here, because if you're someone that's given appetite, and look, I mean, I love a good meal. Right? I love food. But so if you're getting invited or you're going to be in a place where it's like, hey, this ruler, this king, I mean, they've got, they've got everything. And they know how to use that stuff too, right? So if they want something out of you, it's easy for people who don't have anything to easily become a pawn or used by just throwing a little, a, a little uh, uh, prosperity in front of you. Oh, here's... Here's this, you know, whatever it is. Oh, wow, this is great. You know, saying, put a knife to your throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties. It doesn't matter what he has and how cool it is and how great it may taste or whatever. Like, 
don't get wrapped up in that. Don't get enthralled in those things and just become covetous and want to have that for yourself where that's going to um, distort your, your view. It says, for they are deceitful meat. It's not all it's cracked up to be. And, and the riches and the power and everything else, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Those people are never satisfied. The people who are rich, they're never satisfied. It's never enough. You'd think when you have more than you could want that you'd be satisfied, but they're not. It's more and more and more. And we're going to get into this passage in just a minute, but you know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's no surprise that these people who do get all this money, well, they're not satisfied. You know, they're not satisfied with the silver. They're not satisfied with the gold. They just want more and more and more. And they'll stop at nothing when, they ha when you have that covetous mind and covetous heart to get those things. And then it still doesn't satisfy. And there's that void that you continue to try to fill. And, and it's, it's miserable. From the outsider, it's like, how can you be miserable? That just looks great. It's deceitful meat. Verse number four, labor not to be rich. Look, the Bible teaches us, especially men, to labor, right? And to work hard and support your family and provide for your own and, and, and all that. And, and look, we ought to be very hard workers. But don't labor to be rich. Labor, labor to provide, but don't labor to be rich. You have to know when to stop and cut it off and have a good balance in your life to where I'm not going to labor so much to, to have this goal of becoming rich. You should never have that vision or mindset where you think, I want to be rich. And see, this is the truth of God. This is from God's word. The world will listen to what I'm saying right now and think, you, you know, that some people even say Christianity is, is enslavement. You don't want people to succeed. You don't want people to become powerful. You do, you're trying to keep people down. You're, you know, you're holding people back. No, you don't understand. You're a fool. You're a fool if you think that that's the, that's the way that you ought to live your life and that you ought to give yourself over to become rich and to desire to have all this stuff. You are a fool. You should not labor to be rich, Dave Ramsey. You should not labor, ever have that desire to be rich. Now look, get out of debt. Great. Right? Go ahead. Get out of debt. And I don't care if you, you know, who you listen to, whatever, but... The guy's got a lot of focus on, on becoming rich. Right. A lot of focus on becoming rich. Don't, don't allow that mindset to creep in and start influencing you to desire to be rich. It will be your downfall. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Yeah, your own wisdom, the world's wisdom is going to tell you, well, why wouldn't? I mean, of course I'm going to try to be rich. No, don't. The, and I think I've got the, the verse here. It's in Proverbs 30. I think I've got the reference. Yeah, Proverbs 30, verse 8, the Bible says, remove, and you don't have to turn, you can stay there in Proverbs 23. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. That's the desire that we ought to have. That, this is the wise outlook we ought to have. Look, I, I don't, I don't want to be poor, right? I don't want to be in just utter poverty. But I also don't want to be rich. Just, just give me food convenient for me. Just what's going to get me through. I don't want to have to struggle like literally just every day of my life. I'd like to be a, just a little bit comfortable, but not so much that I'm just like rich and, 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 and just have everything, right? We, we ought to have a good, healthy struggle in this life. I don't want to be in poverty. I don't want to be rich. Just please just sustain me, right? And seeking the Lord to sustain you is where we ought to be. Verse 9 says, lest I be full and deny thee. See, when you get to the point where you're full, that's where the danger comes in of being lifted up with pride and thinking, what do I need God for? What do I need anything for? What do I need church for? What do I need you for? What do I need to read my Bible for? I got it all figured out. I've got it all going good. Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So saying, I don't want to be in poverty either because I don't want to be tempted to have to steal and think that like now I, like in order to eat, I've got to steal some food or something, right? Like I, I don't want that either. I just, I'd rather just kind of be right in the middle there and, and be able to live my life, serve God, 
and still be humble enough to, to, to serve God, but not so poor that, that I don't, I, I'm literally thinking about stealing from people. That's where we ought to be. Uh, verse number, in Proverbs 23, verse number 5. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? He's talking about riches as being that which is not. Like it's not even there. It's an illusion. And it really is. Because the amount of time that it's here for is so short. What is your life? It is even a vapor. It appeareth for a short period of time and vanisheth away. Right? If your life is a vapor, what about the riches that are here that are all going to be burned up one day anyways? Amen. It's garbage. It's going to be good for nothing. So, um, you know, cease from your own wisdom. Will thou not set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, and ain't that the truth? They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. You think, you, 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 here today, gone tomorrow. And boy, the day after I get paid, that is the... <laughs> Payday is great, and then the birds take away all my money, and it's gone, like, really fast. I, I, could, I could relate to this passage really well. They make themselves wings, right? So who cares? Who cares, right? Who cares? Who cares about the money? Don't let, get your heart fixated and set on the riches, on the money, on the prosperity of the wicked. Don't worry about it. It's nothing. And, and let's just keep reading here because we're, we're, I'm... Chomping at the bit to get to the good part here. Verse number six, eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meat. So it's making reference to this again. Like don't, don't be taking this stuff from these wicked people either. Like just have nothing to do with it. Someone's trying to offer you, oh, come, come with me and have this great meal and have this, you know. And you know, when you get that, that sick feeling in your stomach and you come across someone that's just pure wicked and you can just see it in their eyes and, and you know something good ain't going to happen here and they might be powerful and they might have a lot of influence, just don't even go and eat with them. Just, no, I got, I got other plans. Don't allow them the opportunity to, to try to, to get into your head and, and, you know, get that, eat that bread with him that hath the evil eye. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. If someone like that approaches you, it's like, they don't care about you. They want to use you for a reason. They want to entrap you somehow, and they're going to use the bait to get you. The dainties, the meat. And he's like, what are dainties? I don't know. It's going to be the fancy fruit or, or, or uh, uh, desserts and, and fancy meals and whatever, right? Like all the, the, the real lavish, luxurious stuff that you go to the restaurant and you're like, 500 bucks for a meal. Like, no, like what? <laughs> for, for something like this big? <laughs> no. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. It's going to poison you. It's going to ruin you, Right? So he's saying, that he's saying just stay away from that bread. Don't receive it. Now, obviously, the physical bread isn't going to do that. He's talking about when you start receiving of what they're giving you, you're, you're going, it's, it's going to be poison in the end for you. It's not going to work out good for you. Uh, jump down to verse number 17 there in Proverbs 23. The Bible says, let not thine heart envy sinners. And, and remember that too. When, when, when you see someone and that's out there that you know is a wicked person, have no desire to want to have anything about that person be for you, you know, like, like just have no envy at all for that person whatsoever. Let not that heart envy sitters, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. And not necessarily all of the rich and powerful, but many are gluttons and drunkards, right? And the Bible says, don't be among them. They have nothing to do with that. Obviously, they can be of all uh, economic status, right? And we should avoid the gluttons and drunkards anyways, but... Um, you know, this is, this is in a similar context here with, um, with the sinners, right? That, to not envy them at all. Uh, flip over to chapter 24 there in Proverbs. 
Chapter 24, verse number 1, the Bible says, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. For their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. I don't care what they have going on for them in their life. Don't, don't meddle and mingle with the, with the evil people. Just have nothing to do with them. And definitely don't be envious of their position, of their status, of their power. Jump down to verse number 19 there in Proverbs 24. The Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Now, let's keep reading here back in Psalm 73. So the, the writer here, Asaph, notices how extremely wicked people are that are prospering in this world and how he foolishly has become envious of, of that or almost has slipped into that trap of, of wanting this. Verse number 13, the Bible reads, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. So now this is his, his thoughts after seeing this wicked person starting to get envious. He's like, well, why did I cleanse my heart? I mean, it was for nothing, right? And I washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Like, this guy's got everything great, but I've been, you know, yeah, he's wicked, but he has everything. I'm plagued. I'm chastened every morning. Yeah, but you know what? There's a good reason for that. Hebrews 12, and you, you don't have to turn, you can say in Psalm 73, Hebrews 12, 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, or of all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So he's, he's kind of complaining here, saying, you know, look, I've been plagued all the day long and chastened every morning. Well, you know what? Then that means that God loves you, Amen. right? This guy's getting away with everything. He's super wicked. But when I do anything wrong, I'm plagued every day. I'm being chastened. You know what? God loves you. Rejoice in that fact. That guy is a bastard. He's not a son of God. So he has no daddy to chasten him. Amen. That's why he's not getting chastened. Because he's not born again. Because his father, the devil, doesn't care about him at all. And he's fine with him going off and, and doing wicked things. Verse 15, if I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. <laughs> Isn't that true? And again, I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail anymore tonight. I'm leaving that for Sunday. But people getting offended, the generation of thy children, which is where we're at now, being offended, you know, just from a righteous person trying to say anything that's right. Behold, I should, get, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. So it, he's just like, this is too hard to, to, to see. Like, I'm getting punished. I'm righteous. He's not righteous. He's wicked. And he's got everything. And, and this is what he sees. So he's just like, it's too painful. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Yeah, out in the world, it doesn't make sense. When you come into the house of God, Oh, it makes perfect sense. Amen. Oh, I see. Oh, I just need a little bit of wisdom from God. I need, I need to hear a little bit of truth about the way things really are and the things that I don't see that are yet to come. And then I understand their end. Now I know. Now it makes sense. Oh, you've been chastening me because I'm your son. And he's not. But his time is coming. Verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. That's their end. He's describing their end. Yeah, 
They're up real high now, but that's a slippery slope, and they're going to slide right down to hell into destruction, into desolation, and they will be utterly consumed with terrors. They're not afraid of anything. They don't think they need anybody right now when they're on this earth, and they seem to have everything, but that changes in a moment. They think it looks like they have their strength when they die, when they pass on, and then immediately they're in darkness, they're in desolation, they're in destruction, and they're in terror. It happens in a moment when they breathe their last breath. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Just another verse that talks about God hating people. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. So now he's, now he's recognizing like, oh, <laughs> yeah, what was I thinking? Becoming envious at that person whose end is to be burned. Amen. No, <laughs> no, bro, I'll, I'll, I'll stay here and, and, and I'll suffer with the, with the dad that, that wants to chase me every day. I'm cool with that. Because I don't want to go to that place. Amen. That, this is the same concept, right? That, that everyone's all upset about. Look, I'd much rather deal with things poorly in this life and go to heaven yeah. than have everything in the world in this life and go to hell. Amen. That's the bottom line. How that concept escapes so many people is beyond me. It's one of the most simple things to understand. But the heathen are going to rage, and they do. Yeah, the heathen are going to rage. I'm talking to you, heathen. Not, not you. Or you, or you, or you, or you. You. I'm pointing at the camera. Whoever it is out there that's raging right now, burned up at the fact that how could dare how dare you say that it's good for the person that was put into slavery if they got saved? How dare you say that? Well, I do dare. Amen. And you know what? The the who however many it was, and I have no idea, no idea how many slaves were not saved that got saved after coming to this country. I don't know how many that was, but I guarantee you every single one of them right now is happy they got saved and, and would never trade that if it meant that they were going to go to hell. If it meant they are going to go to hell, they would not trade that slavery. Amen. Not for a second. foolishness of the people is the ones that try to say like, oh, so they had to become saved. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Of course, there's other ways to get saved. But it happened. Right? And, and, if, and if, if because of those circumstances people got saved, I say praise God. Why wouldn't you? Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy comfort. And notice, I am continually with thee as opposed to those who go into desolation. Being desolate, you're forsaken. You are far, I mean, you are away from God as opposed to being right there. Close. Now look, I'm not the person who's saying hell separation from God and all this other nonsense, but there, there, is, there is a nugget of truth to that, Right? People take that out of, uh, just, just really run wild with that. But you don't have any relationship with God other than being at the end of his wrath right. if you're in hell, right? The lost, that's, that's what they have. That's all they have. But the saved get to be by the Lord and in his good graces and as his child, as a son, part of the family. That's good. He says, thou shalt... Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, in verse 24, and afterward receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll go into this a little bit more in depth. I, oh, good. I've got a little bit more time than I thought. First Timothy chapter 6, the Bible teaches in verse number 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And this is what the Bible is teaching us in Psalm 73. Don't be desirous of the wicked, right? Don't envy the sinner. Don't envy the wicked. Don't be desirous of his dainty meats, like it says in Proverbs 23 and 24. Don't look on those things and desire those things. Just be content with what you have. Be content with where God has placed you. And, you know, and good night. These thoughts are just too intermixed. Okay? I'm going to put them aside and deal with it on Sunday. There's too much. It's, just, it's been on my mind a lot. It's just, there's so much truth in the scripture regarding this stuff. And, and, and good night. So many ignorance, so much ignorance out there. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. The spoiled brats of this world, hey, be content. That is what the Bible is teaching you. If you call yourself a Christian, if you believe in the Lord, you believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be content. Stop trying to, to, to complain and, and try to get more. And, oh, this, this. Be content with God, what God has given you. Amen. Just be content. I guarantee you have a much happier life, first of all, because a lot of people just love going out, going online, making these videos, complain, 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 complain. Complain about the white man. Complain about this man. Complain about that man. Complain about everyone else. Complain about your boss at work. Complain about the government. Complain about not making enough money. Complain, 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 complain. It's called murmuring in the Bible. You know what? God hates it. You know what the Bible teaches? Be content with such things as you have. Be content. Learn to be content. Praise God for what he's given you. Whether you're a servant or a master, that's what the Bible teaches. Be content. Having food and raiment. Do you have food and clothing today? Be content. But I don't have the newest iPhone. <laughs> it's a stupidity of our, of our stupid culture today. Our American culture that just, this entitlement attitude, thinking you have to have everything and you have to have it now and you're going to go into debt to just get everything right now because I need to have everything now. Be content. Be satisfied with what you have. And thank God for the food and the raiment that you have. And you have way more than food and raiment in this country right now. Amen. Guaranteed. Amen. Guaranteed. And it's people's stinking pride, ignorance, arrogance that's, that's making them all spout off about all this nonsense and junk. Verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. That's what happens to people who, want, who labor to be rich. That's what happens. You want to be rich? Because that's what it means to will, to want to be rich. You're going to fall into temptation. You're going to fall into a trap and into the foolish and hurtful lusts. It doesn't stop with just the money. It's, it, it becomes all manner of evil. 
Verse 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many sorrows come along with that covetousness, with that desire to be rich. You want to be rich? Be ready for sorrow. Or don't believe the Bible and have to experience it for yourself because that's a fact. You can believe it this way and have faith and not get involved or you can do it and prove the Bible right. Either way, that's what happens. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Let's go to Psalm 37 and we'll close with that. Psalm 37. Also very similar in theme. Ironically enough to Psalm 73. 37, 73. Right? It's, good. it's good. good trick to remember if you want to know a, a good parallel to Psalm 73. Just go to Psalm 37. I literally just noticed that right now. Psalm 37, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. So first of all, don't be bothered by evildoers. Like, don't fret over them. Don't let them, you know, rattle your cage. And neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. You know, definitely don't envy them. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. That's what's going to happen to them. They're going to be cut down. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. This is where we're going to see the good. The good. So, so you think you're going to get rest. You think you're going to get food. You think you're going to get all of these desires of your heart by wanting to be rich. The Bible says, no, you're going to get sorrow. No, you're, you know, that, that's going to pierce you through. It's a trap. Don't fall for it. But if you have faith, and if you live in righteousness, and you follow the Lord, and you trust in God's word, then he's going to provide all those things for you. Then you will be fed. Then you will be blessed. Then you will be happy. Then you will have joy. He brings all the things that you think you're going to get by desiring to be rich if you don't desire to be rich and just follow the Lord. The way of the world is destruction. It's death. Listen to God's way. Listen to God's word. It's good for you. It's not necessarily the intuitive way of this world. But praise God, he's told us, trust it. It works. It's real. It's true. Put God's word to the test. You'll, you'll see that it's true. You'll see it's true. You'll know it's, I mean, I know it's true. And you'll, you'll know it for yourself. Over and over again, the Bible just proves itself true. It doesn't need to be proven with any uh, uh, mathematical equation. It doesn't need to be proven with some fancy type of logic work to, to build it up. To, it proves itself in life. We see it. We experience it. We know it. Look at, these, at this wisdom in the Psalms and the Proverbs. It's tr as true as a day is long. I mean, you, you see it. It's evident. Verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. He wants to give you your desires. But don't covet after money and riches. But God will give you the true riches. And God will give you, where you look, just, just follow him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. 
that's the right way. It's not the way of wealth and riches and money. Verse 6, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Don't let that distract you. Don't worry about that. Just wait on the Lord. He is faithful, and his word is sure. It's not the immediate gratification right now. That's not the way God operates. But stay faithful to him because his word is sure. You know what's unsure? The riches of this world. They make it wings like a bird. A stock market crash, all those million and billionaires, whoops. Many of them. Many of them, they're, they're, those birds fly away and they don't come back. Gone. People's fortunes get turned into nothing overnight, literally. Verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yet thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. The wicked that prospers, they're going to come to nothing. They're going to be gone. So don't worry. Just wait. Just wait. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Yet when God gets rid of the wicked, wow, how much peace are we going to enjoy then? When the wicked are brought to naught, no more stress. <laughs> no one coming after you. No one trying to hurt you and take the, you know. What a day that will be. Verse 12, the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Just remember that if you get people coming and gnashing their teeth against you, God's laughing. God thinks it's funny. Why is it funny? Because these people are so proud and full of themselves and they think they have so much power and they think they've got everything and God's like, you have nothing. And I can just take your breath and cast you to hell right now. Like, who do you think you are? But people get so full of themselves and lifted up that they forget God. Jump down to verse 25. While we I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Amen. You don't have to strive to be rich. You don't have to desire to be rich. Don't focus on getting rich. Take it from the psalmist here. I believe this is David. I've been young and now I'm old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God will take care of you. Sure enough. Proven over and over again. as proven in his lifetime. I've lived a whole life. I've yet to see it. I've yet to see God forsake the righteous. Or see his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. You have no reason to seek after riches. God will be there for you. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. That's the good news. Don't be envious at the prosperity of the wicked. And, and have foolish thoughts of going, Oh man, I wish I could have all that stuff. It's fake. It's fraud. It's phony. It's not what's cracked up to be. It may look a certain way. It's not the way it is. Stay faithful. Trust in the Lord. And, and, and he will guide you and direct you and give you the desires of your heart and take care of you. And one day we are going to inherit the earth. And, and the wicked doers are going to be cast into perdition. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the 
great words of wisdom found here in Psalm 73 and, and elsewhere in the scripture, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to, um, to never get distracted or, or caught up in, in the cares and the riches of this world that, that cause so many people to become unfruitful and to, to kind of fall away from their faith. And Lord, please just help us to stay humble and to serve you in faith. And Lord, I pray that you would please just give us the wisdom to, uh, to continue to, to serve you in a way that would be the most pleasing in your sight, dear God, and that uh, we wouldn't let our flesh get in the way. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.